Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Doctor Who in Review. Uh, my name is Louis Lacau. I represent Man Bites Media, and I am joined by the amazing host, Misha T. Mulchin from Diversely Geek. Why, hello there, Louis. As hey. always, it's great to be back for another episode of Doctor Who in Review. Yes, it is. And this week, we're doing a special presentation because... I mean, come on. It's a week before San Diego Comic-Con, and it's going to be an intimate discussion between Nisha and myself about one of my favorite topics and one of my favorite attributes of Doctor Who, the skin of the TARDIS and all, all that lies inside, the wondrous cave that is the TARDIS and what how it changes with every single doctor, what it does, how, why it does it, and what are we getting from that in terms of like an inner look of the doctor every time we see the, the TARDIS change. So, Nisha, first question. Let's go into what, what is one of the, the exteriors that you think is the most fascinating of the doctors? Uh, exterior not interior correct exterior yes yeah i know because we, we we definitely were discussing um huh so I, I mean i have been watching a long time and i was thinking when we decided to do the show about what the about the movement and the change of it since the very first doctor because as you know it was a big silver cylinder <laughs> yeah. when, he, when he first took it out i would have loved to have had a chance to explore that more because then, you know, it gets stuck becoming the, um, the police box. Ah, that's a really good question. I like <laughs> the exterior during the time of the 11th Doctor actually quite a bit. It was that very clean, clear. slick look. Yeah, very clean and slick look. I very much liked it. Um, maybe because I had such a high level of comfort with that outside of that TARDIS. Because they actually built that into a lot of episodes. They yeah. did a lot of hanging off of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think, you know, I really like that very much. Um, I, I do believe that the TARDIS for the War Doctor. Yes, um, that worn, beat up. The very worn, beat up. Destroyed, like, well, it really destroyed. matched his steampunk look. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his warrior look and his, you know, the, 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 the ageless, endless war. Um, type of um, empathetical. Yeah, so, definitely. So I think I like those very much as well. And of course, I like the, I actually like the seventh doctor a little bit too. Like those. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love, my favorite by far is the ninth doctor. I love uh, Chris Frackleston's um, TARDIS because it has this kind of grungy, beat up, worn down exterior and this is where where i got the idea for this episode honestly and for coming up with this uh, this uh talking point was because i love how the tardis kind of is that reflection of the doctor this is our first inklings of what the doctor is going to be when they reincarnate is the exterior with the exception of the 11th because the 11th, we don't see it until after it finished baking and we get the personality first, which yeah. is interesting. Um, but it, it's so fascinating how it changes, especially in, in modern Who. Because classic Who, yes, it does its changes, but it's not as drastic as modern Who, where they've taken it and made it a part of the show. But go ahead, Nisha. No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. Finish that sentence and then I'll jump in. Mm -hmm. So I, I really love that, that beat up exterior because it, it is 100% that representation of what the doctor was. He, this is a doctor that was dealing with PTSD from the time war. This is the doctor that is not only in relationship to the show being coming back after such a long period of time that audiences didn't see this doctor. So, and this is from the outside look, obviously that we're seeing this, but that's also a representation of what the doctor is supposed to represent as well. And B the emotions and everything of the doctor needed to be alongside with that. So 
they created this whole thing with the time war and that that kind of that gave that that story that we could plug in in between those those years that were missing those 16 years that were missing besides the movie that was in between um that doctor who really didn't have a tv show running and i think that was important to give a very heavy doctor the comeback because that's why this show has maintained now for so many years already it's incredible for 14 years and running still strong so yeah that, that that's yeah. my point honestly I, I love that doctor i love how it looks and it looks so grungy inside i love it i get exactly what you're saying about that and you're looking really at the um it's as a physical expression and manifestation of the psychological trauma that he was going through, which if you juxtapose it back to the seventh doctor, to this very, um, to a more modern clean edged look, um, that doctor had, a. it wasn't that the seventh doctor was more polished per se. It was that there was a different personality. Well, he was more polished. It, it, it was- okay. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but yeah. No, I mean, he was was aristocratic, you know, very, very much like part of the the aristocracy. It's a very aristocratic um, air and a personality, even though there was a lot of wit and witticism to him. And I feel that 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 TARDIS definitely had this sense of representation of that. Um, What I always thought was interesting, and let me go back to you with the Ninth Doctor and... um, then even go on to the 10th in a sense. I feel that the movement and the flow that, that the set designers had with the, with the change in the TARDIS, you and I know, and we're saying, to, we're talking today about the fact that it's representing not just the emotional journey of the doctor, but that one, the journey of the TARDIS itself, because the TARDIS is a, um, is a transcendental being in my, in my book, oh, as yeah, far as I'm concerned. Sure. And, um, Really, there's a living, breathing sentience to to the act to, to action ability of that doctor, right? I mean, of the TARDIS and how it responds to the doctor. Yeah, definitely. Hey, you lovely nerds! This is Joe coming to you from Diversely Geek. Diversely Geek is a global nonprofit that promotes self acceptance by highlighting the positive messages of fandom. We're all fans of something that has affected us for the better. We like to express that love by embracing our inner geeks with you all on our podcast, Diversely Geek Discusses. We also have a podcast for any Whovians out there called Doctor Who and Review. We often partner with Man Bites Media, so you're bound to come across us sooner or later. You can find us on all podcast platforms as Diversely Geek Discusses and on all social media platforms as Diversely Geek. You can also subscribe on our website, diverselygeek.org. Live long and may the force be with you. So I have, I thought you were saying that the, um, if you, that the TARDIS itself is a very, is a living, breathing entity. And it's an extension of the doctor's internal being, internalizations and his internal psyche, struggles, I think too. Yeah, his psyche, his, um, the, the consciousness of the doctor. And I've always said that the TARDIS for me, for as long as I can, reflect on it has always been somewhat of a conscience for the doctor um but, but we don't see it as much until the new who uh, newer who is where we actually see it fa- manifest more physically right yes Spartus is like nope you can't do that you can't go there you have to go where i take you, <laughs> you know? yeah. i love like i and this goes back to an, a it's a different fandom but it's i kind of draw the parallel um in and I just recently started watching uh, Next Generation, and it's incredible. Like the the oh my god, I completely blanked out on her name. I can't remember her name. The one that that um she is able to the counselor on Counselor Troy, Deanna Troy. Counsel, yes, Deanna Troy. Um, I I think of Deanna Troy and Picard as the TARDIS and the Doctor. They have this kind of interesting connection that is psychically connected yet 
they sense every emotion that's going on. And that's, I, that's kind well, of the relationship that I drew before we get that's, to that episode. That's what Troy is. Troy is an empath. Yeah. Um, so Which I think the TARDIS is the same thing. Well, the TARDIS is beyond an empath. Well, yeah. So she's, and I'm, I'm saying, and this is where I'm getting to, the TARDIS is a uh, much, uh, uh, it's beyond the six dimensions of existence. The TARDIS has multiple, multiple, multiple layer after layer after layer age after age after age um, worth of psychic connection worth of memory retention uh, experience the logged that sits like all of these layers that I think for me, like and when I see it, I understand what you're saying there. I feel like the, that we are looking at a being that, is connecting us to the history of the doctor, but also again to the brain and the 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 the, the neurologic the neurologic and the psychologic function of the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I I I see it in a in not I mean machinations, but I see it as God. I, so I, would I, you say it's it's a counselor to the doctor? No, <laughs> I wouldn't actually because she the, the TARDIS as a she doesn't counsel the doctor. Have you ever noticed that? Not until the day that the the wife of the doctor, you know, that episode. Yes. Uh, where she manifested. Oh, my God. Idris. That oh, episode. That episode was everything. That is on my top ten episodes for yeah. Doctor Who. It's, oh, oh my, my God. Mind. We are at the end of the earth. We are at the end of time. We are at the end of, do- of all doctors having at the brink of annihilation and he's lured it to the end and there he finds because of time and space and relativity and a physical embodiment of the TARDIS Idris who wanted nothing more than to be able to communicate with the doctor physically yep. to be able to counsel him in this way but to see him as hello beautiful because she actually was calling saying that to him yep. even though he was saying it to her it was actually her saying <laughs> And them having this beautiful soulmate relationship. That's what I'm talking about. The TARDIS is an extension to the extent of being more than a soulmate. It's just these two indelible beings. So, you know, the making the choices for him were because she knows what's best. And she told him that in the long run. And yeah. was willing to expend part of her life and her life energy to be able to get ma- be manifested enough to have that conversation. So, Which was yeah. incredible. The way that they portray that episode, the, the amount of delicacy that they gave to that character, yet fun and beautiful personality that is portrayed in the that character and i love the lines they they're so careful about choosing the lines that this manifestation this her manifestation that is of the tardis because the tardis is, doesn't have a sex it's none it's non-binary and i think that's amazing that they brought it up and and she actually says the manifestation she says oh, I took this personality because you have shown interest in a personality similar to this. Mm -hmm. So this is why I chose this personality. But I don't exist as either one. And I love that because the the doctor just goes, okay, I'm I'm good with that. Let's continue on. I, I still want this. And that shows you how beautiful Doctor Who is that you could be this amazing, beautiful being and have no, no, it's complete gender fluidity in this show. There there doesn't need to be any uh, gender, and gender, uh, what do you call it, identification throughout this show. It's incredible. I love that. It's absolutely unnecessary. Beings are beings. Exactly. And that's what the message is of that episode. It's like, dude, the most incredible and amazing being of all existence, the TARDIS, this, this machine yet not machine is this entity that, that gives the doctor the ability to travel through all of existence and do all these adventures as a companion of the doctor. 
and more. And it's incredible that they're able to portray this message in such a small little time span of one hour and give that message across clearly, yet not hitting you over the head and preaching it. It's, it I love it. it the subtlety it, in the show is incredible. And what's really in, um, interesting is from the very, because, you know, they created this conscious, they're con- very consciously created uh, a character in the TARDIS. The TARDIS is its own living, breathing character. And at the very beginning, since with production, since Verity, um, the decision to, to, to have uh, the chameleon circuit falter and break so that, you know, our doctor that we know, our doctor is no, not able to change the appearance of the TARDIS. It's stuck in the police box. But, you know, in, in classic who we do get treated to a couple other time, time Lords who have TARDISes that can disguise themselves. Yeah. So isn't that interesting though? Can you imagine like, cause I, I mean, they, wow. Yeah, exactly. Your mind, okay. your mind just understood the fact that, mm-hmm. that the TARDIS can't change their outward appearance, right. but they could change their inward appearance and show this manifestation of themselves whenever they want. And they are true to themselves. Well, they don't need to change this exterior, uh, what do you call it, coat that that kind of protects them. Because guess what? They don't need a chameleon circuit. Uh, circuit. Well, circuit. you're talking about you're talking about the doctor's chart. It's not like say, the the meddling monk or the master, because they Correct. have the ability to theirs changes. But that and tells I, you about the character too. That's what I was just see. That's exactly what I was driving home. I'm driving home that with this doctor that. The TARDIS itself, for me, yes, it's a broken chameleon circuit, but wasn't there an episode, and I think it was in the Idris episode, um, Doctor's Wife, or perhaps it was Journey to the Center of the TARDIS. Didn't they come across something that looked like maybe the circuit really wasn't broken? Maybe it was purposefully like it was? Um, I think that was in Journey into the... uh, Yeah into the center of the TARDIS. I don't know. I have to look that up, but I, I could, I could swear that there was at least one episode where the doc, where the doctor's trying to fix, always trying to fix and realize, wait a minute, this is kind of like not plugged in. (laughs) You remember? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do remember something. Yes. I just can't remember. I know it's modern who that, that presented it. It is. It's modern. It wasn't classic. That look. So, and what, what I, what's, what's interesting is exactly what you touched on. Um, so with classic who there's a very classic, very, um, streamlined look to the interior rooms. Um, from what I remember from the fourth doctor all the way to the seventh, um, we see all of the rooms. We see where people stay. They live in the TARDIS. It's yeah. a living experience. With Cl- New Who, it's not like that. We rarely get treated to that, as a matter of fact. Uh, of course, in the episodes with um, Amy and Rory with the 11th Doctor, we're treated to it, but it's it's terrifying. It's a, it's literally, <laughs> a, you know, uh, Halloween, um, uh, um, Halloween Horror Nights. <laughs> you <don't> know? <laughs> yes, it is. It yes, is. it is. And so... So like you said, I think it can be terrifying at the same time because we don't know what's manifesting, right? We don't know what, what, what part of the history and those multiple layers of that onion are going to be man, gonna, going to be revealed in that episode and what, you know, what emotion is going to, the Cardis is going to spew at everyone. So, cause you know, those two episodes are scary as all get out <laughs> so oh i love them though they're so incredible and especially the the doctor's wife that that just kind of i i loved it because it it gave that voice to a character that we haven't really heard a voice oh, to I know. connect to it. so it finally came out and and talked and gave us the thoughts and the way that she portrayed that character was flawless it oh, was absolutely. flawless absolutely like it, it's exactly what i i want i would have wanted 
to Mm -hmm. represent the TARDIS. It's exactly what I wanted. That playfulness, that kind of like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to play with your emotions. You know, I I, I just love that. That's just, that's completely exactly what I would have expected for for the TARDIS to do. And also have Was the TARDIS playing with the doctor's emotions or was the TARDIS just stating a matter of fact? Because the the, the TARDIS always knows more and knows better. So everything that the doctor is doing, the TARDIS knows better. Yes. And it knows the direction that the doctor needs to go in because it makes sense. And at some point in time, there's a couple episodes I, that clearly, you know, jump out at me where the doctor's like, oh, thank God. Basically, hey, you know where you sent us to the right place. So you made the right decisions. You, 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 know, you knew that if I went somewhere else or was somewhere else where I intended on going, I would have been harmed. So, Especially Eleven. Mm, Especially. Good God, man. Jeez. That, <laughs> with that everything doctor. with River Song, <laughs> it's incredible. It it really is. Yeah, I I, I but the thing is, is that R- River, um, the Charters trusts River. Oh, exactly. so that was one of the other conversations you and I were going to have today. Remember? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, who does the Charters trust? Yes. Which that is fascinating because. Like we've been bringing up, the TARDIS has emotions, has a personality, has a being. So the TARDIS trusts certain people and gets jealous about others mm-hmm. and wants to get, you know, feisty mm-hmm. with others. So you get a little shock if if the TARDIS doesn't like you. You get a door slammed in your face if the TARDIS doesn't like you. You might get thrown out of it into the middle of space, <laughs> you know. I, the TARDIS has a little bit of an attitude, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> and it, it really does show kind of the, the characteristics. It's like, all right, the TARDIS is, is that guardful friend, you know, the, the one that says, oh, you could, you could date my friend, sure, but you better be careful because mm-hmm. if you do something wrong, you're going to get your, your butt kicked, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is is awesome. Or the only one, (laughs) the only, the only being or entity or transcendental being that has the ability to mess with the doctor to that extent would be the TARDIS. Oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) So and it does, it does, it plays with their with his emotions or or their emotions rather a lot. (laughs) Um, it's a mystery and. That's the fun part that that the TARDIS understands what the doctor wants and is going to go through. They they know the existence, every path that the doctor could potentially take from here to eternity. So all paths are known to the TARDIS and the TARDIS is giving a guide map, but not necessarily making the doctor go down a certain path, which is awesome. Because that that's kind of incredible because it's also kind of a little bit of a quorum on on uh, religion and beliefs as well. Because mm-hmm. how much free will does humanity have or, or humans in general or beings in general have? And that's kind of what the TARDIS represents. Even going down the, the what do you call it, um, the time vortex and everything, you're going down a certain path and you could come off the stream. And the TARDIS could guide you and give you kind of an entrance way and give you kind of directions, but it's not always controlled by the TARDIS. Sometimes it's up to the doctor to make the decision where to go. And that's fascinating because that's also, a, a, has so many different, uh, what do you call it, aspects that we could look into just on the mm-hmm. TARDIS itself. There's so many, like you said, Nisha, the onion, the, 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 what do you call it, different layers of the mm-hmm. onion that we could peel off and continue peeling off. And it's very much infinite, just like the TARDIS's interior. There's no end to it in sight. <laughs> no, there's absolutely none. Um, I wanted to say, there's just so much more to say about the TARDIS. I think if I had to look back in the history of my understanding as a child watching this show, probably the thing that fascinated me, one was I did start with Pertwee and I really did love um, Pertwee's character and how relevant he was in, I guess in my life at the time. But 
you know, the funny thing is, is the TARDIS wasn't a huge part of that introduction. Nope. Right? Yep. So then when the TARDIS became a part Especially of my... Especially tree. <laughs> no, exactly. Hello. <laughs> there was no, you know, no TARDIS. There was no TARDIS. It was like sitting in the corner of this room, yeah. <laughs> um, which is flash forward to the uh, 12th Doctor. And yeah. Oh, yeah. In the corner of, the, <laughs> of, of his... Um, School. Of his office in the yep. university. I was like, oh, this is so reminiscent because he was also grounded, you know? So, yep. um, but there are moments where the TARDIS just leaves. Yeah. It's gone. The TARDIS is gone. And just says, yo, I'm kicking you out. I'm going to go do my own thing. Right? Yeah. And what do you think? What do oh, you we think? saw that with the 13th. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's like, okay, you find your way back. You find your way back and do it on your own. And th- that was incredible because the doctor did it. And that's what I was saying about the highway, the choices that we have, the, the road path that we have, that it, it's a very much of a, a symbol of what is going on in the fandom. Yes, there's roadblocks. There's a lot of obstacles in the way. We run into a lot of things that we might not enjoy of the show. But in the end, you're going to get, to where you want to be which in this case in this analogy it's it's a show that you're going to find and continue to find incredible messages that you could hold on for the rest of your life with uh these messages of virtue these messages of of complete intense love and appreciation for all things in the world in the universe and everything that all stems from doctor who it's all encompassing in this show. And mm-hmm. it, the TARDIS is the representation of that. It, it's a hundred percent, the representation of that besides the doctor itself, the TARDIS is, it embodies everything that we're talking about that, that free will, that existence, that yes, you're going to go through tr- tough times. You're going to be on the verge of exploding and things might work out in the end. And it, it's incredible because that's that's it's a very incredible message and it's very real. It's not that message. Oh yes, we're gonna do it. We're gonna finish what happened, and there's not gonna be any consequences. No, Doctor Who has consequences. You're gonna see if you do something bad, you're gonna see the consequences down the road, and you're gonna understand where it came from. And I, I think that's the difference with this show and a lot of sci-fi shows. A lot of sci-fi shows don't show you the consequences. This does. The Doctor is burdened with so much. So much. And the TARDIS is going through that same thing. The the TARDIS is suffering from major PTSD. Nobody gives that another thought. They they look at the Doctor and they see this... this, uh, What do you call it? Yeah, the TARDIS suffers the... um... The um, ignobility and the um, and the frustration and the the the, sh- the stress on the of watching the doctor go through. <laughs> Not just the doctor, everybody that comes but on board. Everyone who comes on board, and again, if you know who is the doctor willing to have on board of that TARDIS? It's I mean, who's the TARDIS willing to have? Because make no mistake, she's sharing her um, her energy with them, right? You know. Um, because they all um, absorb a bit of time energy, pixie mm-hmm. dust, as it were. And that's something that's shared from the TARDIS to them. If you've been a companion on there for a long enough time, right? Yep. Uh, because you actually get embraced by the TARDIS and you are able to have hear and see and do things that you would normally be able to do. So. Welcome to an exploration of sight and mind. A travel through the world of films and the artists that bring you these masterpieces. Do you love films, directors, actors, cinematographers, editors, composers, or any of the hundreds of artists that bring you these feats of art? I am Louis Lacau, your host, into the world of films, your guide to Man Bites Retro. We're we're talking about a family structure at the same time. Yeah, we are. Uh, right, right. Yeah, uh, 
And 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 who does who does again the multiple on? layers, multiple onion layers. Yes. Peel back. Yes. <laughs> I, I I miss having TARDIS episodes. I told you. I think that's how we even came up with talking today about it. Yeah, I miss definitely. It. I, I miss having having the companions more familial, as it were, and more relatable in that family structure. I have no problem with that happening on the TARDIS because I believe it gives us an opportunity for them, the companions and the Doctor and the TARDIS, to, to exchange to create the human exchange and build backstory that we probably don't always get a chance to get. So I kind of hope that we get to have at least one. There should always be at least one full on TARDIS episode, I think per season. I agree with you. Yeah. And that's the thing though. Like we had that and that's why so many people connected with the Matt Smith era was because we had that familiar uh, connection with Rory and Amy and River spoilers um and it, it kind of it has that connectivity to 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 them and i think that's why america in particular connected so much with that doctor was because it has that family aspect to it that we could relate to and it is a very relatable subject and i agree with you i want to see more of that because mm -hmm. We got a little bit of it during Classic Who, and it was moments, it was spurts of it for little per periods of time, and then they'll move past it. I want more of that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be human. Like, I want other characters to come in, even Time Ladies or Time Lords, other Time Lords to join the Doctor on this journey. That would be incredible. And I would love to see that more, more open of that because I want to see the TARDIS interact with other beings <laughs> other than humans and the doctor. <laughs> right. Right. No, I agree with that. Actually. Um, I'm glad that we at least got a bit of an introduction to it with the 13th doctor. Yes. And we've only now gotten back to the TARDIS. Have you noticed that most of this um, season uh, for the thirteenth, the first season of the thirteenth uh, Doctor, we actually didn't pay almost spend any time on the Tardis. Yeah, until the very end. Then we had some fun when, um, you know, the yeah, yeah, the, you're right. Yeah, but there was also, I mean, you got to think about it. Most usually, the first season of the Doctor, you don't get much of the Tardis mm -hmm. because they're flushing out the character of yeah, the Doctor. The characters and stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping with the next one. I just um. There's just such an intrinsic um, psychic, like you said, connection and, um, and, and, and a modeling of how we should relate in a way. Um, and, you know, you're talking about a three-dimensional, multi-dimensional object and a, a time lord and then human beings or whoever else gets thrown into the mix. What an interesting family dynamic. Oh, yeah. What an interesting exchange your thought but um yeah i'm just i i think for me the tardis has always been my favorite part that's because i you know i was saying how i started as younger and when i was younger part we be my first i didn't have the tardis but when the tardis was introduced back to me um or to me then it made sense to me that there was more to it right well that because Think about it. You're yes, it's called Doctor Who, but that doesn't necessarily mean the Doctor's the main character. The TARDIS is the main character. It's the only through line throughout the whole show. The Doctor changes personalities, changes self, changes images, everything. The TARDIS really doesn't. It's still the TARDIS. The only time that it changed was when from the first few episodes. From the first few seasons rather. And after that, it's 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 stuck. That's it. It is always the, the TARDIS that we know, the police box that you see, the beautiful blue police box that you see appear and materialize out of nowhere with that one sound, that swishing sound. That, mm -hmm. oh, that That's the next uh, topic that I wanted to bring up is the sounds of the TARDIS. Right, the sounds of the TARDIS. And oh, it's just yes that, that it's it's the only way that the TARDIS could communicate, and it is so fun the way that the uh, Doctor actually 
Doctor Who uses the the music and the sound that the TARDIS creates for fun. And <laughs> kind yeah. of like where they actually realize like, oh yeah, there's a reason that there's so many spots and it's a circle is because it, it's meant to be driven this way. <laughs> and we find out that the whole sound and everything that the TARDIS makes is just the parking brake that's left on, <laughs> which yeah, is fascinating. Yeah, that's because River figures it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting the things that they figure out. Um, I thought, by the way, when they had to journey to the center of the Earth, of the Earth, hello, the TARDIS, um, when the Doctor got kicked out of the TARDIS, remember, and that Clara yeah. gets gets lost in the deepest dregs of the TARDIS, and it becomes this zombie-esque environment, yes. um, extremely horror, horror-driven concepts, and he enlists or rather you know entices with a reward of great money the mm-hmm. three the three um the scavengers brothers, yeah the three scavengers and why do you i mean looking back at what we've already talked about what the chart is allowing the three of them to be on yeah think about that what did so the TARDIS knew that they that there's something had to be achieved Right? Yes. So yes. to achieve it, the deepest, darkest part of the TARDIS itself had to be brought out. And we, we knew that it existed in there because you can't have so many, you know, a, a billion layers of, 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 of pain and suffering and angst and, and, and strain and, and so much more exists without at some point seeing the darkest side of the TARDIS. We've seen it in the doctor. Mm-hmm. I, I've the first instance that comes to mind is that episode where he's facing off with one of the Daleks in the first season and back to Christopher Eccleston. He yep. shows this no empathy whatsoever to, to this Dalek that we have. If you're a first time viewer into modern who and never seen classic who or anything, you, you have no idea. Is. You have no idea what this being is. And you want to show sympathy. Even the human is showing sympathy towards this this being that is is dying slowly. And the doctor's like, No, you cannot. You cannot. It is all a trick. It is all just play acting. And I think that's fascinating because that's again the it goes back to the trauma that he ensued and it's the same thing with the the TARDIS I mean the TARDIS is going to be able to pull out some really dark you know stuff (laughs) god all I could think with that episode and with um, the doctor's wife is how much how much pain Mm -hmm. must be there um, and I and I it's just not hitting my mind right now. But the other episode with Rory, Rory and Amy, where they're mm. aging and they're trying to find each other to save each other, but as they do that, they find diff- so many different. Um, they pass through so many time loops. Yes, they, they do. See themselves dead in various stages, just you know, having died, and. Oh, like that episode, even right now I'm talking to you about it and I can't think of the name of it. If you look it up for me, it would be great. Um, that episode was someone reading my mind in a sense and saying, this is what it would be like if you looked into the soul, the inferno and the core of the TARDIS and you saw time just looping around you in, 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 in chaos um, yep. without any, without any lineality to it. This is what it would look like. You'd have, there'd be no, you, you'd have no, no way to be able to control the circumstance that you're walking into because there's literally a thousand, a million different op- options, right? Yep. For you to walk into. And so for me, wow, first of all, that's life right there. Because that's every second we wake up, every moment we wake, every day we wake up or every moment, we're constantly facing all of these, you know, a myriad of, of possibilities and options for how we're going to exist. And then the other thing was how we had absolutely no control. The doctor had no control whatsoever 
over the, the, the extent and the depth of the darkness that was going to come out. Yep. Exactly. But it, it needed to come out. Yes, it needed it to happen. It's kind of like the purge. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah. it, it really is a, a testament to the characters and the way that the, the story is written and everybody gives, you know, Moffat a lot of grief and all that stuff, but he's a brilliant writer. I mean, he really is like some of his episodes are incredible. The way that the characters flush out and the stories flush out. And I mean, granted the, the doctor's wife was written by Moffat, but it was under his direction and under his guidance. So it, you know, that tells you a lot. Granted, I'm pretty sure, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, guy d- didn't, you know, he, he, he probably took the rein and said, okay, I'm writing my episode. And, and, you know, Moffat gave it to him because he's a brilliant writer, but you know, either way that, that, that design was set up by him. And I, I definitely do think that, that it's incredible to what we see with the TARDIS, honestly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, whew. It's yeah, a big conversation to have, and unfortunately, as I'm sitting here and having it, and I say unfortunately, I'm also kind of getting lost in the reminiscence of the moments. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very strongly connected to things, so <laughs> very much so. And... um. I was yes. just talking about that episode and maybe it came out all flustery because I was thinking and feeling. I couldn't find the episode name, by the way. I was, I was looking for oh it. I couldn't God. find it. Yeah, it's, um, I'm going to have to look it up. I can't believe I cannot find it. I, I can't really find it, but I, the episode no. that comes to mind with me is the that one episode where they're stuck on that planet and it is, oh, it's right after the Minotaur episode um the girl who weighed it it's where amy is separated in the in the facility that it's it's a containment facility that is the, the most oh, pain, one of the most painful yeah horrific things honestly but episodes. that's that's pretty much like that's the doctor and the tardis going through time and space and they're they're suffering through those same situations all the time and I think that episode is a perfect portrayal of what the Doctor and the TARDIS deal with from the beginning of the show to the end. And I think that's a very important part because, yeah, it's the reason the Doctor would never take the TARDIS as, as a, what do you call it, to marriage or anything to that extent is because, first of all, it doesn't exist it doesn't exist in our reality. It's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond even the doctor's comprehension. What's in the, in the TARDIS. Mm -hmm. And I I think that, that what do you call it? Um, the, the TARDIS portrays a lot of what the doctor's internal struggle is, but it also gives kind of a linear path for us to follow as viewers of to to kind of give us those inklings of what the doctor is and um obviously before we we start running really long on this episode i think we should wrap up with uh, some of our closing thoughts on what do you think the the tardis is what you know what what do you what do you enjoy about the tardis being that kind of intricate character in the show and how it portrays its outer skin, inner skin, and everything about it throughout the the 50 plus years that we've been watching Doctor Who. It's been the only constant. Yeah. It has been the only constant. And while the TARDIS, the external and even and the internal TARDIS itself changes because it's a reflection of the Doctor, and even the companions that are with the Doctor at the time, the TARDIS itself is the only absolute constant. And it's actually the only constant for any Time Lord. It's interesting that over time they made a decision to not have us see the Master's TARDIS. Um, because in the old episodes we did, and I do miss having the opportunity to do that. I don't think that fans would, would be upset at that. I feel that it would lend a lot more to the storytelling and to the depth of, and the dimensionality of the relationship of being uh, and relating to being a time lord, it is part of a story or a storytelling that I think we should get the opportunity to see again. 
relating well, I'm back. hoping that they bring back Gallifrey. Relating back to Califrey, exactly, 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 exactly so, what I was going to say. I missed that. I missed that very much. Um, but we're still only in the first, you know, second season coming up of the Thirteen Doctors. So, yes. Um, so I want to ask you the the question that you you brought up. What would you? What storyline would you like to see the TARDIS go into? Or what would you like to see the, the the story of the TARDIS come out and be flushed out even further? I would really like to find out if if fifty something years later we don't know if the if the TARDI <laughs> <laughs> if they relate to each other. Do they have some type of inner circuit circuitry that allows them to keep in touch? To know if that they have a, a greater mastery of all of the the Time Lords um, travel tales and the history of the Time Lords travel tales because I feel sometimes that the TARDIS knows so much more than what we've had the opportunity to learn from the Doctor's point of view. And why is that anyway? Why does the TARDIS know so much? Mm -hmm. Um, What type of connection does the TARDIS have at a a galaxial level, at a universal level, with the, the, the dark matter and the matter that make up the universe. Wouldn't you be interested in knowing that? Um, because it's an energy that, that that's literally fueled by the energy of the universe, right? And yep. by the, so, w- those are two story arcs I would really love to know. One, do the Tardi Tardises, whatever, do they relate to each other? Um, are they created with a common circuitry that, that that where they have a learned memory? You know, yeah. can you imagine? Oh, I'm going to piggyback on your answer, actually, because it's exactly what my answer was exactly that. But the twist to it is, is the TARDIS a species rather than a creation? Right. That I totally. Yep. Mm -hmm. What if it is an, an entity that has existed through all of time and space or an evolved form of existence? that we've never seen before. And maybe that race picked the Time Lords to allow them to piggyback on them and travel through time and space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. if the dark, sadistic um, Time Lords captured this race and used them like we used to use horses as to do our bidding and to do our, our basically slavery. Oh, that's, that's, that's fascinating in a dark direction to go in. Um, <laughs> so I went with the light and the dark, a little bit of yeah. both. <laughs> um, and, and my, and, and again, I came and with my two, which are very similar. Um, where does the TARDIS fit into the demand in, into the, um, in the creationism, creationism of the, of the universe. You cannot tell me that a being, being that is as sentient and as intuitive and empathetic as the TARDIS was was created. That there's only a simple creation of creationism myth in terms of a Gallifreyan culture that's created a TARDIS, and you just go and you turn it on. That's impossible. There's so much more to this. But not only that, we need to know. <laughs> you know that the TARDIS has has a personality has an existence has a being they are existing there's a personality there meaning if there's a personality that means there's life that means there is actual Mm -hmm. it's it's not just a being it is a race because it is not a time lord it's not just a computer because it exists it is a being it has a personality it has traits that deem it to be a being so that means it's its own race the tardises tardi are their own race (laughs) and it's fascinating and i would love to see exactly what you said that backstory behind where they came from why they came into being or if they were created and just life leapt and we created they created uh, artificial intelligence and it just grew from that but oh i would love to see if it's so much more than that because i think it is 
and I it would just be really interesting to see that you know mm-hmm. see that's like some ancient race that uh you know were the harbingers for for the time lords or they were captured by the time lords it's fascinating it's really fascinating mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but anyways so thank you so much everybody for listening to our amazing conversation about the tardis and our philosophical approach to everything that that we love and our tangent and uh, what do you call it? Conversation. <laughs> Everything that we encountered along the way. Because um, right. <laughs> I mean, when you have a conversation about Doctor Who, it just it, it's not just one linear path. It's all timey wimey, wibbly no, wobbly no. stuff. It, it has to be. It's yeah. a very organic um, conversation about. I, I see it as like a constant state of flux, like a ball <laughs> and the ball's con- like a ball of light and matter and all this stuff <laughs> just constantly morphing into something else. That's what I see it as. Yep. That's what exactly. my mind creates. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so wanted thank, to know. <laughs> right. So thank you everybody for listening to us uh, while we journey down this path of Doctor Who. Uh, the show is obviously called Doctor Who in Review. Uh, Nisha, where can we find everything, social media, and all that beautiful stuff? For Doctor Who in Review, you can find us on Diversely Geek Discusses. Um, as you know, you um, can listen to us on all of the major podcast channels. I believe. We're on iHeartRadio at yes, this point we are. as well. It's being on all the major channels, um, iTunes, Spotify, etc. And um, we will continue to bring you bi-monthly episodes. And until, of course, the new season where we'll be back with weekly episodes. Yes, yes, we will. And my name is Lewis. I represent Man Bites Media and, of course, Doctor Who in Review, obviously. But uh, Man Bites Media, you can check us out on manbitesfilm.com or you can find us on all the different podcast sites that you could imagine and platforms. And we have an amazing new show that we have recently started with Nisha T. Mulchen and this amazing journey of our other favorite fandom of all time, Lord of the Rings. So if you love Lord of the Rings, please go check out Cellar Door, a journey into Middle Earth as we explore in a very scholastic, dramatic approach to the story from creation to to the books. And we're going to explore all of that from the actual beginning till the end of the books. So we're going to explore all of that. And it's all dramatic approach. So if you love reading or listening to to dramatic podcasts, this is definitely the one for you. And you'll definitely enjoy it. And again, go on to manbitesfilm.com if you want to check out all the other podcasts. And you can go on to diversityGeek.org to be able to um, click on one link to find all of our social media channels and all of our podcast channels, which right now is hosted through Spreaker. And, of course, you can visit us on all our major website, um, social media sites. My God. <laughs> and you guys got to jump onto the social medias for Diversely Geek because they're going to San Diego, Diego Comic-Con, Comic-Con this year. And it's not just... Oh, they're not just going to be walking around. No, Nisha's too modest for for to <laughs> say this and all that stuff. But she is going to be hosting these amazing <laughs> panels and workshops that you have to. If you are going to San Diego Con, you have to bookmark it on your on your calendar, and you have yes. to go to these panels, especially uh, a few of the particular ones that if you follow the social media accounts of diversely geek, you're going to see everything that's coming out and you yes, definitely got to join them. Yes. Yes. I know. I'm not being modest. I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you can find us on Friday, um, January 19th at noon to one at Barrio house. And then sun, um, we are hosting one of the newest, um, offerings and of programming for, San Diego Comic Con, which was um, in which is being debuted at the 50th anniversary, we are part of the community offerings because the the um, the block of panels and the and the workshop that I belong to are for the first time ever being offered to the community, and anyone who'd like to be able to attend can come and get on the line and 
uh, mix and mingle with the uh, San Diego Comic Con badge holders. Our panel our, or our workshop is on Friday, Embracing Your Inner Geek, um, a s- interactive self care workshop. Our panel, Representation in Media, Changing and Challenging the Narrative, is on Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m., also at Barrio House. And that one's going to be amazing as well. We have three. Um, my god fantastic guest so um, awesome yes. that's so and so thank you guys so much for listening please subscribe give us that rating give us that that comment like us you know follow us and share us out to all your friends tell us all tell all your friends about this podcast mm-hmm. if you really enjoyed it and we'll see you guys in two weeks for another episode of dr who Have to go and you. yes <laughs>